uh, some elementary concepts and uh, I'll sort of uh, quickly go through and then uh, just to help you to read it. So the course is about computing um, uh, probabilities of outcomes which are inherently random. Uh, but at the same time, um, whenever we look at a problem, there are only uh, so many outcomes. They may be finite or infinite. And I'm going to denote that by a sample space, the way I have done here. For example, if you toss a coin, there are only two outcomes, head and a tail. So the sample space consists of head and tail. There's nothing else. So similarly, in general, I may say there are uh, uh, many outcomes, I, I, uh, events, etc. And in particular, there are something called elementary outcomes. Elementary outcome. So this is elementary outcome is uh, whatever are the outcomes of an experiment. So if you toss an outcome, uh, toss a uh, coin, there are two elementary outcomes, head or tail. If you toss a dice, there are six outcomes, right? Phase one, phase two, up to phase six. These are the elementary outcomes. And uh, then we, we can define events something like this. See, these are events which may cover several, uh, uh, several uh, uh, outcomes and so on. I haven't done it correctly, but uh, so what is an elementary outcome? What is an event? Let me one more time draw it here. Right? So in the case of a dice, uh, this is uh, these are elementary outcomes, and if you take something like this, this is a, another event. This is an event. So event is a collection of elementary outcomes. So usually the probability of the elementary outcomes are easy to compute. So for example, if you take the uh, uh, question is, if you take tossing a coin, the simplest uh, experiment, there are only two outcomes. So you can argue that if the coin is a fair one, each outcome is equally likely. So the probability is uh, the number of favorable outcomes divided by the number of total outcomes. Number of favorable outcomes is one, if you're looking at the head. Number of total outcomes is two, so one over two half is the probability. Same thing here, if you look at a dice, so this is for a dice, right? this is the whole space for a dice. If you take F5, so what is the probability of F5? So you can, this is what we are interested in. So number of favorable outcomes is one, one outcome. But if you count, there are six outcomes. So we say it is one over six. But now the question is, if you mark this red region as A, so this is A, whatever I have marked in red. So the question is, uh, how do you compute the probability of this? Or let's say this is A. So A is everything I have marked in red. So this course is about how to compute the probability of more complicated events. So you make uh, elementary outcomes. This is an elementary outcome. Elementary outcomes are easy to understand and uh, you can use a couple of ways to figure out their probabilities from the context. Uh, one way to compute this is simply do the experiment. In other words, if you have a coin, suppose you toss it thousand times and simply observe how many times the head showed up. Suppose the head came 495 then the probability of head you say 495 divided by 1000. That's one way to compute the elementary outcomes. Same thing for the dice. If you want to compute the probability of F5, you toss the dice 1000 times and see how many times F5 showed up. Then that, uh, suppose it came 200 times, then 200 divided by 1000 will give you that probability, etc. But how do you compute the probability of this, uh, uh, this region where I have marked uh, red? So that's the topic of this course and more complicated things like that. 
So since we have a set, it's good to know the concepts of a set theory. So set A is maybe a collection of outcomes. So the, these uh, sets may be finite or infinite. So the psi i's are the elementary outcomes here. So psi i may be here, psi j may be here, etc. So A is a collection of these sets. Same is B. B is another collection of uh, etc. So there, you know their union. This is A union B. So I'm just going to mark here. This is A union B. The set of all elements that belong to A and B. And then you have A intersection B. So if A is this, B is this. So A intersection B is this region, the set of elements that belong to both A and B. And then you know the obvious ones. So this is the whole set. And then the null set is a set with no uh, elements, empty. And A bar is everything outside A, etc. So remember, the question is how do you associate the probability of these complicated events from a simple uh, uh, events? So before I do that, I also want to. So look at this case. Anybody? Uh, what is A intersection B? Sometimes we write this as A like this. Uh, what, where, where, how do you mark A intersection B in this case? Anyone? Uh, it's zero. Empty. Yeah, no, not zero. It's the empty set. Null set. Empty. Okay. So physically, this is the A intersection B wherever they meet. But if they don't meet, that's a... So you call these two sets mutually exclusive. So this is a set theory concept, mutually exclusive concept. And then there is the De Morgan laws. I'm going to leave it to you to study. Uh, you can write this uh, this way. And A in the section B complement is A complement union B. You know, you may ask why this is true. So you draw these diagrams. And uh, uh, remember, I say, I told you, uh, today's is very elementary lecture. That undergraduate book is free. If you go to Amazon today, tomorrow, day after, you can download it for free. And that has got a lot of problems. It may be useful. It certainly is useful for a few lectures at least. Maybe some of you have uh, already downloaded from Amazon. <coughs> this is the book on undergraduate problem problems. I think. Then there is another book uh, which uh, contains. Uh, uh, undergraduate lectures, uh, lecture slides, it's also very helpful. So again, the question is, how do you associate uh, probabilities to uh, these complicated events? Remember, elementary outcomes are easy to understand because it makes sense. You can describe. But more complicated events are not that easy uh, to comprehend. Uh, so we need the rules. And that's where the axioms of probability helps. I I am expecting you that move, uh, you know. Paper down a bit. What is that? Can you move, move the paper down a bit? Yep. What do you want me to do? Nothing. You are fine now. Oh, oh, oh move the paper. <laughs> So the axioms of probability says the probability of the whole set is one, which is easy to understand. And uh, probability of any set, any uh, set is positive, non-negative. That's all. <coughs> so these two are obviously, you will say this is uh, nothing, common sense, of course. <coughs> and the third axiom is if A and B are mutually exclusive, so you are looking at this situation, A and B are like this. If they are mutually exclusive, then the probability of their union is the sum of the probabilities. <coughs> A 
remember axioms are self evident so this <coughs> this sort of makes sense because what it says is the probability if they are like this then the probability of their union is the sum of the probabilities so of course these these are the only three axioms okay so of course uh, you can extend the third axiom what if you have many years like this anybody let me call this a1 a2 a3 etc so what if i take the union of all this i equal to 1 through n anybody uh, it will be 1 look at the a1 a1 a2 a3 etc or here only with the things i marked it, it will be the union of the possibility of a1 plus a2 plus yes a3 right so uh, remember uh, the pr probability will be one for this whole set right look at here look at the first axiom the whole set has got probability one that will be the whole thing but here you uh, this will be this is not the whole set the union so the, but you can, how do you prove it anybody uh, somebody said it is a sum of the probabilities how do you prove it you have to use the previous axiom to prove this whatever you said i think someone said this is this true is this what you said Yes. How yes. do you prove this? Uh, so from the set theory, we can uh, certainly see that uh, all the um, a one, a two, up to a i are mutually exclusive. Okay. So from the th so from the third axiom, we can say that the union of all of these sets is going to be the summation of all these. Oh, that uh, how do you how do you know the third axiom? Look at what she is saying. Third axiom only says about two of them, two sets. Here you have n of them. How do you prove? you can't just uh, jump from here to here you have to this is only good if there are two of them anybody you can use induction all right so this is what we can do so we have a1 through an so i am going to call all this to be b so i have a1 uh, and you can see a1 and b are a1 b their intersection is of uh, empty so p a1 b is going to be p using axiom number 3 p a1 plus p b and then use b uh, proceed on this b you can write it as a2 union c etc you understand you go by induction like that yes yes sir all right so you can do this if this is uh, if you so if this is a finite number you can extend this this way so this is just certainly true but remember you have to go by the axioms you can this third axiom is only about two sets so the way we, not by induction you go by uh you go by steps but they, they, you only need a finite number of steps because there are only finite number of sets uh, so for a finite number of uh, set union which are mutually exclusive it's the sum of the probabilities uh, what happens if i am just asking this how can you extend this proof if there are infinite number of them anybody i have because here the argument is i can sit down and do n steps so that is not a problem i can this will go on but what if the, uh, the what if i have infinite number of mutually exclusive sets all the a's are mutually exclusive a a j is empty then what is this probability anybody uh, will that be 1 1 what is that uh, will the no, probability be 1 not going to be 1 because a1 a1 is like this A two is like this. A three is like this. They may get smaller, but they are never going to. Is a situation like this? Why will it be one? You still have empty space. So, what will be the probability of the union of these sets? Anyone? What is the probability of this union if the union is only over a finite number of them? We already did. What is that? It is the sum of Uh, separate uh, individual probabilities from so one through n right yes and what about if this uh, uh, if there are infinite sets it will be one to infinite how will, you, how, will you, how will the why how will you prove that as i said if it is finite i can do it step by step so if it is infinite how do you prove it by by induction induction it what as i said uh, induction is uh, Uh, induction means i can sit there uh, after a finite number of steps it will be over this will never be over so the question is is this true or false so the brief answer is 
whatever we did here we cannot do it here because uh, just uh, too many things to, we will never be able to complete it but it, uh, but you are right it looks uh, true so we will take it as an axiom this is the only way to assume that so this is the uh, if there are infinite number of sets we are going to assume that this is true because it is true for any finite number we can prove it but we cannot prove it for n equal to infinity so we'll take it as an axiom also okay so no big deal it can be done now let me uh, ask you the question what is the probability of a bar anybody so one minus p a yeah. how do you get it one minus uh it's the mutually exclusive uh, set p a a bar and a so if you add you'll get uh, the whole set. So you see what she is saying, A union A bar is the whole set because look, the picture is like this. If this is A, this is A bar. And then what? So probability of A union A bar is what? Uh, 1. Because that's the same as probability of S which is 1 by axiom number 2, right? Or axiom 1. But on the other hand, these two are mutually exclusive. So this is by axiom number three, this is equal to? Summation of PA and PA naught. Right. So we get PA bar equal to one minus PA. But notice that I used two axioms and this is what I mean by a proof. What is the probability of null set? Anybody? It will be zero. How do you prove it? Remember, the axioms don't say anything about the null set, so probability. So how do you prove null set problem? Uh, we'll take two uh, mutually exclusive events and... Uh, what is the mutually exclusive event? A intersection B and will be... A, and uh, so. a integration, A mutually exclusive is not going to involve the null set. You'll only get uh, A bar is 1 minus P A. How do you prove uh, the probability of phi equal to zero? Anyone? Because null set does not have anything in it. So So that is not the proof. That's what I'm saying. Whenever you try to prove something, you must use only these three axioms. You cannot one use... minus the probability of the same whole thing. So you, you can prove it this way. I'll show you. So remember, so what you are trying to do is you're doing by hunch and uh, doing by common sense and so on. That's not a proof. Proof is your axiom. So you have to. So how do you prove this again? Anyone? Uh, the so whole set and sorry, the, <clears throat> sorry. Go ahead. Could you take the probability of a intersection with a bar, and then you know that those are uh, mutually exclusive. So that would be the probability of a plus probability of a bar. Yeah, we already did that. So you get probability oh, no, no, of a bar yeah, is one yeah, minus b. Yeah, that's going in the wrong direction. <laughs> um, no, no, you are good. Now, one are... thing is you put, uh, let me put it, since you went this far, we have this expression, PA equal to 1 minus PA bar. Anybody has any idea? What should I take A to be, to show this to be uh, true? What should I do? I take a special case of A. What should be A? A, yes. so, uh, what? A should the be super S. Set should be what? S. The whole yes, yes. A equal to what? It will be the S. Either way, you can take A to be S or A to be null. Take, let's take A to be null. Then uh, then we have P0, P of null set is 1 minus P of A bar. What is A bar? Anybody? What is the complement of the, null set? The entire set. Whole set. Whole set. What is the probability of that by axiom 1? 1. 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So this is the way you prove it, things. All right, let's do a little complicated stuff. So if A and B are like this, we know the probability of their union is PA plus PB. Why is this true? Anybody? Why is this true, the, what I wrote? Because they are mutually ex exclusive. Uh, that is, uh, because they are given by axiom. This is by axiom number three, right? Yes. Okay, what if the, this is what I want to prove. I want to... I don't want to consider this case. I want to consider this general case where A and B are not mutually exclusive. How do you do it? So remember, uh, so the question is, what is the probability of A union B in general? Remember, quickly, you need to use the axioms. So A union 
A bar intersection B is the same. All right. So if you if you notice this, I'm going to write this A union B in this way. So you can see, again, all this is there in the notes. So I'm just going to quickly do it. Is this correct? A, so the interesting question is these two are mutually exclusive because I want to use the axiom number three. So you could do the other way also. You could write it as A, B bar also, but this is fine. I hope you see that, right? A union B, which is this whole region, is the same as A and this red region. So this green region plus red region, this is A, and then this, this together will give you A union B. So probability of A union B <coughs> is probability of, so I'm going to use axiom three, PA plus PA bar B. Okay, so we are here. So if you ever want the probability of A bar B, that's PA union B minus PA. In some problems, you will need that, etc. Okay. Now the question is, how do you simplify this? Remember, A bar B is here. So if I just write B alone, so, so this is A bar B, and the whole thing is B. So what is this green region? Anybody? What is this green region? This The whole thing A. is B. A, B. Yeah, because, uh, so this is A, B. So notice B can be written as, is this true, what I just wrote? Because A union A bar is the whole set. Whole set intersection with B is B, so that is true. But now if I use the distributive law, this is A, B, union, A bar, B. But these two are mutually exclusive. So we get probability of B is probability of A, B plus A bar, B or probably, again I used axiom number three. So probability of A bar B is PB minus PAB. So I'm going to take this and put it into here, one. So I get PA union B, please look here, PA plus PA bar B, A bar B is here. So that's going to be PB minus PAB. So this is an important relation. Okay. So you should. Uh, so what happens if A and B are mutually exclusive? What is A B? Anybody? What is the third term? A B. It will be empty or zero. Yes, not zero. It will be empty, and the probability of the empty set will be uh, zero. Zero. So we get back the old expression. P A union B is P A plus P B. Yes. I didn't understand that. How 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 we decide the uh, the um, what was the, the, the there was a symbol. What is this now? What is the piece you didn't understand? What is that portion you did not understand? You just decided that um, it was zero for this example. Now, did you understand this proof, the last line? Is it clear? Yeah, it is clear. And what is that not clear? I said if A and B are, take a special case, A and B are mutually exclusive, then what happens to the last term? If A and B are- Yeah, that would be zero because they don't have any- Yeah, yeah that's all I'm saying. Right? If A and B are not mutually exclusive, you should use this expression. There will be three terms. That's all I'm saying. Yes? Yes, sir. That's all, right. So I think, uh, let me see whether... Uh, So you can use uh, all of this to, uh, uh, there will be a homework problems which uses this. So this is A or B. So the probability of A or B. So uh, of course you can see here what is going on. PA is this probability. PB is uh, this probability. 
So notice that this region uh, it gets uh, added uh, twice. So we take it out once, but that is not the proof. The proof is the way I did it, but I'm saying physically you can see what is going. So P uh, to summarize P A U D N B, we have three expressions. If you want, you can write it as this way, or you can write it as P B plus P A B bar, or you can write it as P A plus P B minus P A, whichever way. So. All these are useful, and uh, you should be able to use this. And we'll we'll use this. Uh, uh, this will keep coming up throughout the course, one way or the other way. So let me introduce a notion of conditional probability. So we perform some experiment. And something has happened. So we uh, so then we ask the probability of uh, what is the pro conditional probability. So this is the whole thing. We read it as conditional probability of a, a given b. Given b means b has occurred. So this I am going to define as P A B divided by P B. This is the definition. Okay. So remember what I am trying to say. I am trying to update, and this is where the learning comes in, machine learning and all sorts, or the general topic of learning, or trying to understand. If something else happened, I want to update my knowledge about A. That's what is going on here. Uh, so this is uh, the PAB. Remember, we know what is AB. AB is the intersection of A and B divided by PB. Now you may ask why this. I am going to explain to you in a second. So how do we even know that this is a probability? So let me go over to the next page. So the question is: Is this definition a probability? So so we'll check all the three axioms. So the first axiom says probability of uh, this should be uh, let's compute this one. This should uh, probability of the whole set give, uh, given B should be let's see what it is. So this is by definition S B divided by P B. What is S intersection B? Anybody? The whole set intersected with the B. What do you get? Probability of B. No, no, no. Just a set. S intersection B. What do you get? Oh, it's B. B. Yeah, because look, this is the whole set B. So S intersection B is B itself. So you get PB by PB. That's one. So the first axiom is correct. So let's check the second axiom. A given B is uh, PAB divided by PB. PB is positive. PAB is uh, non-negative by uh, by uh, axiom number two. Axiom number two says. Probability of any set is non-negative. Non-negative divided by positive will be non-negative. So the second axiom also is satisfied. So the third axiom is: let me take two sets which are uh, mutually exclusive. A and C are mutually exclusive. So A is here, C is here, and let's say B is something like this. So let's compute uh, probability of this. See how this comes up. A complement C given B. <clears throat> so let's see whether axiom number three is satisfied. So I'm going to call this uh, D for now. So this is probability of D given B, but by definition D given B is what is it? Anybody? What is D given B? P D B upon P B. By P B, right? So let's look at DB. DB is what? D is A. Professor, shouldn't we be checking for the union instead of intersection? Yeah, I made a mistake, right? You are right. So it is true. We are starting with two mutually exclusive sets as here, but I am looking at the union. Thank you. I am going to check because look at the. Look 
Look at the third axiom. Uh, we are looking at the union, right? Not intersection here. You, probability of the union is sum of the probabilities. So, uh, so D A B D is A union B, A union C, intersection with the B. Oh, but this is by distributive law. Remember, this is like a, a logical plus, and this is logical multiplication. So, anybody, what is this? How do you explain this? A intersection B union. C and B. C intersection B, right? So, I'm going to substitute this uh, here for D B in the next page. So, probability of uh, what we want is A union C intersection B is, we have probability of A, B. Look at your notes, union C, B divided by P. Uh, Professor, could you just pull the page a bit down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. So look at here, D, B is A, B union C, B, which is what I'm going to substitute it here. So look at that. I substituted the last line, A, B, C, B here. And remember, A and C are mutually exclusive. So let me draw the diagram here. This is A, C is mutually exclusive. Then I have B here. So if you look at A, B is here. And C, B is here. And you can see these two are also mutually exclusive. So what happens to the top? Anybody? This and this are mutually exclusive. So what is the sum of the, what is the probability of their union? Anyone? It will be the sum of separate uh, probabilities. P, A, B plus P, why, C, why, B. Why is it, uh, why is that true? Why? Because uh, they are with axiom three. By axiom three, the numerator will be A, B plus uh, B, uh, C, B. Divided by P, B. So I'm going to divide each just to save. But now if I use the probability of uh, conditional probability definition, this is P A given B plus probability of C given B. So the third axiom also is true. So what have we proved? If A and C are mutually exclusive, then their conditional probability of uh, A union C given B is the same as the probability of A given B plus probability of C given B. So what it says is whatever we, whatever we um, uh, thought of a definition here, this is a good definition because it satisfies uh, one, two, three, all the three axes. I just proved it. So we can use uh, this as a probability of A given B equal to PAB divided by PB as uh, this is a proper probability because it satisfies all the so we can use either the regular probability or if it makes sense somewhere we can also use the conditional probability as i said the sense is a b has already occurred so let me look at a special case so let's say a belongs to b so b is here a is here. So you can see this is the this is an example where A is a subset of B, right? Look at the way I have drawn. So let's find out the conditional probability of A given B. So that is probability of A B divided by P B. Anybody? What is A B? Anyone? In this a. case? B. What is it? A. 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 So what can you conclude now? This is greater than what? Anybody? Zero. No, of course it is greater than zero, always. P of B? P, yeah. Probably what? P A, sorry. P of B. Oh, what he said is P of A. Why is it greater than P of A? Anyone? Well, P B is at most one, and it's a number from zero to one. Yeah, anyway. right. So maybe I forgot to tell you also. Of course you know that P B is, any, any probability is between zero and one. Why? 
What is PB plus P bar B? PB bar. Yes. One. One. Yeah. One. So PB is uh, one minus PB bar, right? But PB bar is uh, greater than zero, so this has to be less than one. So either way, right? So I, I just proved it. But uh, so the, you have a special case. So again, try to think in physically. If A is a subset of B, if you know, and then you know that B has happened, then the pro we can say that. Uh, the conditional probability of A given B is greater than P A. For this to make sense, let me go to that dice problem. What is the probability of getting an F1 if I know nothing? What is the probability of getting a phase one if I draw the dice one? Six. One sixth, right? It has got uh, six, but suppose now. I say B is, uh, B is, I say outcome is even. I'm sorry, outcome is odd. In other words, uh, so B consists of F1, F3, F5. Okay. This is B. So if, uh, I'm going to give you the information that I actually did the toss the dice and B has occurred. So this is some information I am giving you. So the question is, what is the probability of F1 given B? So according to us, it is F1 B divided by uh, B. So what is F1 B, anybody? In this case, B is this test, this set. So what is F1 B? F1, that means F1 intersection B. What do you get? F1, F1 is one set. You intersect it with the B. What do you get? One over three. F what did you get? F one over three. Uh, you are confusing. I, I am asking a simple F thing. F1 is one F set. F1, you call it A. Uh, B is F1, F3, F5. So this is like A, B here. This one. What is A, B? F1. A, B is F1, right. So this is probability of F1 by uh, probability of B. Probability of F1 is 1 over 6, somewhere here. What is the probability of B? Anybody? B is the uh, outcome is F1 or F3 or F5? 3 by 6. Yeah, probability of B is what? 3 by 6. 3 by 6, so that is half, right? Uh -huh. So this is 1 6 by half, this is 1 3. And now think of physically, it makes sense, right? If I am telling you that the outcome is already odd, then you know that, and then if I ask the question, what is the probability of getting one? You can argue many ways. You will say, okay, there are only three outcomes, one, three, or five. And so probability of getting one is one over three. Whichever way you go, you get the same answer. But this answer is higher than this. So all I'm trying to show is that why this inequality is true. So if A is within B, then this is, what if A is the other way? What if uh, B is within A? Then what is probability of A, B divided by uh, A given B? Anybody? Uh, it's going to be 1. How do you go? So it is P, A, B divided by P, B, right? What is P, A, B? Anybody? A, B is P, within B. B, B. B, right. So you are right. How does it, uh, do you see it physically making sense? Uh, because look here, this is A. This is B. So you can see if B has occurred, A has certainly occurred, right? So that's correct. Yes? Uh, B is a subset. So this is like saying, what is the probability of getting an even number if the outcome happens to be 2? Of course, if the outcome is 2, then the probability of getting an even number is uh, probability is 1, right? So let me do a, a little non-trivial problem. A box has got, uh, let's say, uh, you know, M uh, white balls and uh, N black balls. So we draw two balls. at random, one after the other. Uh, 
I am not replacing without a replacement. So what is the probability of getting So you understand the question. What is the probability of getting the first ball as white and the second ball is uh, black? That's the question. So I already made the notation. I'm going to call W1 is first ball is white and the W2, uh, the, uh, the second event is the second ball is black. So I'm going to notate it there. So what we need is probability of this one. This is what we are being here. So what is the probability of drawing a first ball white and the second ball black? So this is the intersection, right? Second and B2. So we know that if you want, we can write this as because AB is the same as BA. So I can write it as B2A1. Then I can use the, so remember I have this rule, right? Probability of A given B is PAB divided by PB. So if I cross multiply, you get PAB. If you want, you can write it as PA given B multiplied by PB. So I'm going to write, use this relation here. I can write this, uh, this is W1 multiplied by W. Now it is easy to compute. What is the probability of getting uh, a white ball on the first draw? Anyone? Look at the problem. M white balls, N black balls. What is the probability of getting uh, the first ball as the white one? Anyone? M divided by M plus N. M divided by? M plus N. Yeah, that's easy, right. Now look at here. So that's computed. So this says what is the probability of getting a second white ball when, when it is given to us that the first ball is white one. So the first ball is white one. So one white ball is gone. How many white balls are remaining? M minus one. And the N black balls, right? Yes. And so what is the probability of getting a, a black ball now? What is it? And divided N by N, N upon M plus N minus one. All right. So you multiply these two, you get the probability. So you can see the use of conditional probability. So this was a simple problem. So let me look at this uh, relation. So let me uh, write that. Uh, let me move on with that one. So probability of A given B is PAB divided by PB. So what is probability of B given A? That's also PBA divided by PA. But BA is the same as AB. So that's PAB divided by PA. So if I cross multiply, I get two relations. PAB is PA given B from here. PAB is PA given B multiplied by PB. Or from here I get PAB is PB given A multiplied by PA. So if I use these two relations, I can write like this. I just took these two relations. It looks like a lot of manipulation, but uh, this is a very important uh, relation. This is known as Bayes' theorem. And uh, we are going to spend a little bit of time on this topic now. So just I want you to understand what I did. And you may say, oh, this looks so silly. What is there just uh, manipulating? But it's a very useful relation as you are going to see now. Any questions on what I did? Remember, this is from conditional probability. Any questions? So Bayes' theorem, if you take the topic of learning, how do you make a machine learn, etc., uh, this is continuously used 
in many forms. Inference, all these places, uh, this comes up. Uh, so this is the basic form. I am going to expand this and I am going to introduce the notion of a partition. So let me draw a picture, you will understand what is a partition. So this is the whole set. This is not a partition. So what is a partition? If you have sets which are, all the sets are mutually exclusive, and their union is, look at the picture, this is a partition. So what are the two properties? What are the two properties? If you take their union, what do you get? Look at the way I have drawn. Get the entire set? Sample what? space? What? Full set. Full set, right. So this is not a partition because here A1 and A2 are not mutually exclusive. So this is not a partition, this is a partition. So let me ask you this, head and tail, do they form a partition when you toss a coin? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. All right, let's take the example of a dice. Even uh, F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6, do they form a partition? Uh, yes. How about F1, even numbers, F5, F6, F2? Because F2 and even have, uh, they are not uh, mutually exclusive, so they don't form a partition, right? Right. Uh, anyway, pictorially I said, if two sets overlap, then they are not forming a partition. So if A is this, and uh, B is this, and C is this, uh, does A, B, C form a partition here? Yeah. Yes or no? No. Because A and B have, uh, look at here. Intersection. Yeah, A and B have intersection. Intersection. So I hope you understood the uh, the concept of partition. So I, it's like a coordinate system, orthogonal coordinate system. But, uh, so, in, but th so this will, if A is this, what about A and A bar? Anybody? They are the partition. Uh, they, so always, you can create your own partition. I'm saying A and A bar always forms a partition because these are the two rules. Their union should be the whole set. They should all be mutually exclusive. Now look at this. Uh, so A1 union, A2 union, etc. AN is the whole set. I'm going to intersect to both the sides with the B. So what is B intersection? Yes. Anybody? B. Well, that's could be. And what do you get this side? How do you expand it? Uh, union B A2 up to B A N. Equal to? Uh, B. Are these all mutually exclusive? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Yeah. Why? Why are they mutually exclusive? Well, we're taking the intersection between like mutually yeah, exclusive. Yeah, you can draw it there. See, look at here. So uh, this is A1, B. This, the whole thing is B. And you can see that these are all mutually exclusive. So what is the probability on the left side? Anybody? I mean, I, PB equal to the probability of this whole thing, right? But they're all mutually exclusive. So it will be what? The sum of the probability of the AI, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Then, but I'm going to write this using now the uh, the conditional probability. I can write this as what P B given AI multiplied by AI, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, let me substitute this into this formula. A formula like this. Okay, so I have uh, 
remember base this is Bayes formula a Bayes theorem probability of a given b is b given a multiplied by p a divided by p b but uh, p b for p b I'm going to use this expression for p b so this is p b given a so a i a i a i multiplied by p a i divided by some b is here b given a g so this is the relation that will be sometimes useful so i hope you let's draw the picture a1 a2 a3 etc a and we a yeah, aj what we are interested is b may be something like this so what we are interested is what is the probability of ai somewhere here so let's say this is ai So A given B. So this red stuff is B. So what we are interested in is this probability. A given B. What is the probability that A will happen given that B has occurred? B is this thing. So that's going to be given by this complicated formula. You said this. Uh, okay. So I at least mathematically I am correct, right? And I'm going to uh, explain this to you using a couple of examples now. So you will see how we are going to use a prediction using Bayes theorem. So remember, there are two. Uh, sometimes we use this formula. Remember, A and B you can replace. Sometimes we will use this formula, or sometimes we will use uh, this formula. It's one and the same because this whole thing is P B. Anybody has any questions? Uh, I hope the derivation of Bayes theorem is clear. Now Bayes theorem will come keep coming up till the end of this course, uh, suddenly through the first half. And as I said, uh, this is the Bayes theorem is the uh, if you say a conditional property, I'm just going to ignore it. But there is nothing to learn in probability. Everything is, uh, all the conditional information is used to make predictions and so on. So you better understand the concepts here. And this is how we make, uh, how we learn from our mistakes. Professor, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, why are the index AI and AJ? I mean, why there are two index? Uh, look, at the, look at the denominator. Denom a is this is what I am interested in. This index is a dummy index, so I purposely I can change this to k, right? This is just a summation here, right? Local index. Okay. I don't want to confuse it with i because then it will get stuck everywhere, right? Okay, sure. What is happening in the denominator has nothing to do with the numerator, yes? Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, because this is just representing, uh, there is no uh, index here. This is just representing PB, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right, very good. So let me explain all this using an example, two examples. So we have uh, two boxes. Uh, containing some item, I'm going to call it bulbs, whatever, box B1, uh, box B2. Uh, I mean, they are identical boxes, the way I have drawn. So I'll write the problem here, two identical boxes. Each with 100 items.
If you can read what I wrote. Uh, so box one has 80 good items and 20 defective items. Uh, box two has uh, 50 good items and 50 defective items. Uh, this information is not known to you. Uh, let's say these are uh, goods coming from wherever. India, some stuff coming here. Quality control problem. But the guy, you know, at the, at the guy at the customs doesn't know about this. So he sees two identical boxes, right? So the question is, you go and pick up a, uh, 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 you pick, so the question is, if you pick one item randomly, what is the probability that it is defective? That's the first question. So you pick, you go to the other room or wherever they are, pick one item from, um, the boxes are not marked. I just marked it so that, I remember this information is, uh, whatever reason, maybe on the travel it got uh, damaged and so on, right? Pick an item at random. So if that is the truth inside the boxes, what is the probability that item is uh, defective. So I'm going, this is what we are interested in. I'm going to call this to be D. You can rewrite it. Uh, D is the event that the item is defective. The item that you picked up is defective. What we want is probability of D. So how do you solve this problem? So we look at the problem. If you have three boxes, you extend this to the three boxes. So in terms of the partition, in, if you look in terms of boxes, there are only two boxes. So you can already see whatever you are doing, where is that theorem? So this is where this theorem will be useful. If you want the probability of any item, you can write it like this. So here it makes sense to use the, uh, the boxes as the partition. And B is going to be your defective. So I hope you see this, uh, that I can easily write this as Remember, so that's what I said, you have to solve problem. Everything is in context. Is this true? Yes or no? Because you can see in this context, I have two boxes. So the defective item either has to come from here or have to come from here. That's so we can, we are able to write this in terms of the conditional probabilities. Why do you want to do it? Because it's a complicated problem. If the defective item is here, uh, the probability is uh, something else. If the defective, there are more defective items here, so they are not equal everything. But now you see this is easy. Anybody? First of all, let me ask you this. What is the probability of picking a box B1? Anyone? One huh? over two. One huh? by two. Why is it one over two? There are two boxes. What if the bo one box was uh, double the size of the other one? Yeah, in our in our case, that's the reason I made identical. What if, of course, if I said this is hundred items, this is two hundred items, you can say, oh, maybe this box is half the size of that, so I am going to put my hand into the bigger one. So maybe the probability is higher there. So to avoid all that, I made the boxes equal. So it's reasonable to assume these two numbers are half. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Now, what is the probability of a defective <coughs> given that it came from box one? Look at you have the data. So what will be this probability? One by 20 five. 20 by 100. 20 by 100 or point two, right? Yes. yes. And this is probability of defective given B2? 50 0.5. 0.5, right? Yeah. All right. So uh, if you do this calculation, what do you get? 0.2 plus 0.7 by half, 0.35, right? Yes or no? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's the probability. So what it means is if you pick up item randomly, there's a 35% chance uh, it is going to be defective. Remember, I just made up some numbers. <coughs> So now comes, this is only part A. Now comes the interesting part. Remember, the guy who is doing the quality control has no idea about uh, these numbers. He can, what he can do is, 
he can take the item if it is a bulb or if it is a box of, of fruits he can see whether he can test it out and see whether it is defective or not if it is defective he may decide i am going to check one more item if it is defective again he may say let me check one more item if it all turned out to be defective he may say look three items came defective he may have a rule i am going to uh, send the whole box back to wherever it came from things like that that's what the, how, how the quality control goes so the part b is interesting part b says item is found to be defective so the guy tested the bulb it's found to be defective what we are asking is we uh, what is the probability we have no idea where he picked it up from what is the probability that it came from a box i'm just say box 2 i'm going to ask so what i am asking is what is the probability that the item came from box 2 given that it is defective that's what we are asking look at it look at what i wrote in words and my symbol so you have to you have to picture the problem somebody picked up an item came to the other room tested it found to be defective so you are sitting in front of him so now we can, we can make a guess and or we can compute the probability what is the probability that the item is defective or this is where we will use the bayes theorem so you look at here so we can use this rule i'm just going to so this is going to be d given b2 multiplied by b2 given d we have all the numbers denominator we compute at 0.35 uh, this is a half what is this number i forgot 0.5 all right so that's also 0.5 so what do you get 0.5 multiplied by 0.5 is 0.25 divided by 0.35 so that's uh, 5 by 7 right 5 by 7 is how much roughly Zero. 0 0.7 7.5 7.4 7.1 4 all so this is this way now you know that you will agree with this uh, if the item is defective you will say most likely it came from the second box because uh, look at that box that box has got a lot of defective items but remember we have no idea about this we have we have made this conclusion simply based on the outcome uh, based on the uh, the outcome being defective so uh, uh, so that we so right now what we are saying there is a more likely 75% or 74% uh, likely 74% chance that it came from box 2 so this is the prediction we are able to predict So remember, somebody walked to the other room, picked up an item, came back, and tested it. And the item found to be defective. Then you use all the information to predict. You are sitting in this room. Predict that the item most likely came from box two. So you are making a prediction, and this is the type of problems uh, the uh, that this course is interested in. You get, you have some data, then you want to make the data. To make uh, further predictions. So let me do one more problem. If you don't have, uh, if you understood this, professor, what if the uh, boxes were not identical? Yeah. So then you you can twist the case. So I, let me give you a problem. Why don't you do it at home? So you have one box with hundred, another big box with uh, let's say two hundred items. This is B one. This is B two. So this has got hundred items. Let's say uh, 
uh, ten, uh, 10 hour defective here i change the problem let's say 40 hour defective here okay so this is the data only you know right now what do you want to uh, what is a common sense for if you walk into a room what is the you see one fat box and one small box so uh, now i don't know you can use psychology where will the person go if he is asked to pick up a box he will pick up a box from one of them the 200 one why uh, with what probability mm. one box is let's say physically double the size of the other box We could say two thirds. Yeah. Know. So it is and now. Twice as the other one. Right. You can say yeah. uh, it may be true, may be not true, but you can say most of the. Uh, I mean, if you said hundred people, maybe um, a two third of them will uh, obviously go to the bigger one because it's easy to whatever reason, right? And uh, or especially if you say, if you send hundred people together, uh, everybody cannot jump into the small box, so um, majority of the people will go into the bigger box. so one way or the other way you can say okay so you may you may still say it is half half or you may say it is two third here one third here so this is all little bit uh, uh, uh iffy right uh, so <coughs> so of course if the box are identical you say the guy will uh, equally likely except so why don't you do this problem what is the probability of the box being defective and what is the probability that the defective uh, that it came from b1 given that it is defective why don't you compute these two this is you can try to take this as a problem that to uh, and then you uh, you know, use your sense uh, then you uh, ultimately you look back at the problem and uh, see whether so we are updating our <coughs> updating our knowledge about the let me ask you this if you <coughs> because the person performed the experiment and found the item to be defective you know the box it came from the second box with uh, probabilities a point 75 what if you did not know this so if a person is walking from the other room with a with a bulb in the hand what will you say that the probability it came from b2 anybody hello well, you already know the prior probability no 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 listen to my question somebody is walking uh, towards you from the other room with a bulb in the hand and at that point what can you say where it came from what is the probability that it came from b2 anyone total pro, uh, total bulbs in b2 divided by uh, yeah. divided by total bulbs in b2 listen to my thing uh, we already know there are two boxes there with 100 bulbs each one guy goes into the other room you don't know where he is picking it up from he is coming back with a box with a bulb in his hand so all you are saying is, all you are seeing is the guy walking in with a bulb in the hand at that point if i ask you or what can we conclude about what is the probability that it came from box 2 0.5 wow right you understand what i'm saying i'm asking a simple question if somebody is walking in with a bulb because the two it could have come from either box right yeah and the boxes are identical we know that there is no reason to assume one box is we, we are told that they are identical boxes <coughs> so at that point we will say the probability of that box bulb coming from box 2 is 0.5 box 1 yeah. is point for right yeah when you perform the experiment in front of you you see that the item is defective now look at what happens immediately you can update your knowledge immediately you can say with more confidence it came from d2 because look at the number 0.75 so 0.5 has changed to 0.75 simply based on Uh, this experiment experiment is data usually data uh, to collect the data it takes money and effort so okay. once you collect the good data you should be able to translate that into a probability which is what a prediction which is what we have done here 
so let me, so you do this problem let i am going to move on to a, another example and then i think i will probably stop so this is a problem of switches i have three switches and current going in and out etc so we say each switch is closed with uh, probability p so the switches operate randomly they stay stay open or closed but it can open uh, it closes with the probability p so what is uh, remember how many states are there for a switch open or closed closed yeah there are only two states like a head or tail so what is the probability of the switch being open anybody One minus p. How do you get one minus p? What is the argument? Remember, there are only two states, closed or open. You can see they form a partition. So the probability of uh, closed plus probability of open is one. If the probability of switch being closed is p, then the other one is one minus p. You understand? So again, don't use your common sense. Use the axioms. So the probability that this any switch is closed is p. Probability that any switch is open is uh, one minus p. So what is the problem? If I put an input current, what is the probability that this or input signal will come to the uh, uh, so i'm going to define c so the input signal shows up at the output that's the that's the event we are in the, we want to compute the probability of the input if you apply some current here or a signal here that shows up at the output what is the probability that the input signal comes across at the output that's what that's the first problem so so let me define a ai to be so if i define ai to be switch i is closed what is p ai anybody p huh? P. Uh, P. Right. So this is the, you have to look at the picture, and you have to remember this is simple events. This is what is the given information. Switch I can be closed or open. So A is switch A, A, A switch I is closed. A bar is switch A is open. So S is what we are interested. In. Remember, I told you in the beginning of the class, the whole idea is to. Try to compute the probabilities of complicated events in terms of simpler events. The simple event here is this is a very good example. Sim this is a simple event. This is a complicated event. Now look at the picture. You have to look at each problem. How do you express? How do you express the simple event in terms of the? I'm sorry, the complicated event in terms of the simple events. There are three simple events: a1, a2, a3. Anybody? When will it? All the switch, one of the if one of the switches is closed, uh, we are gonna have the signal. All right. So how do you translate it into uh, in terms of these uh, sets? Yes, A1, A2, A3. Anybody? This is the union of A1, A2, A3. So that is the big step. I think I want everybody to understand what he just said. So this was this is only comes by solving problems. See, we translated this problem, a diagram and explanations, into this equation. Are the switches operating mutually exclusively? Anybody? Are A one, A two, A three mutually exclusive or not? Yes or no? Look at the problem. 
they are mutually exclusive. Yes. How does that mean? They don't affect each other, each other's situation. And then why are mutually exclusive means what? Uh, their intersection is empty set. So that means uh, when one operates, what happens to the other one? They have to be closed. Like they don't know. Uh, look, they uh, listen to again. Yeah, these are usually people get confused with this. They, if a if, uh, can a one and a two uh, be uh, so uh, so the easiest way to think is can a one intersection a two is what anybody is it empty? Yeah, it's empty. Why is it empty? Because if a that means what if a one occurs a two cannot occur. That's what you are saying, right? I think it isn't empty. Independent. Uh, we haven't we haven't discussed the concept of independence yet, but uh, uh, the switches are uh, mutually exclusive or not? They are not. I think it's not. Exactly right. So this is a, a good example. This is not a mutually exclusive in the sense that uh, A one doesn't preclude A two, etc. So I just wanted to let you know that this is. But uh, that situation is good. But anyway, maybe as you said, I should let me pause here. I'll come back to this problem in a second. But let me introduce the notion of independence. So this is a definition. So we say two events are independent if the probability of their intersection is uh, P A B. So how will you simplify this one? Anybody? What is P A union B? Anybody remembers P A plus? P B. P A. P -A. Minus P A. Remember, they are not mutually exclusive. Minus P A. Minus P A. So if uh, if they are independent, what happens to this relation? Anybody? P A plus P B minus P A into P B. P A multiplied by P B, etc. What happens if A and B are independent? Let's see what happens to A conditional B. A conditional B is A B divided by P B. What is P A B? Look at here. P what A is multiplied it? by P B. Divided by P B. What do you get? P A. So what does this mean? Look at here. If A and B are independent. If you give, if you tell if I if you tell me that B has occurred, it has, doesn't affect A because you still A has nothing to do with B. So if, whether B occurs or not, you are not going to change the probability of A. So this is another way to look at uh, conditional probability. If A and B are independent, then conditional probability is the same as the unconditional probability. Of course, if A and B are not independent, then the conditional probability is not the same. What I'm asking is, so my question is, if A and B are independent, what can you say about A bar and B? Anybody? Independent. All right, so once you say something, you have to prove it. So I'll prove the first line. Use the same proof, you go home and try to do, maybe you have to do this in the quiz. I don't know, we will see, but you can use the similar arguments. So let me show A bar. So we have to start with A and B are independent. So this is true. This is what is given. Now, how do you bring in <coughs> A bar? This is true, right? B union B bar is what? Anybody? One. Well said. Set, yeah. All set intersection with uh, A is A. A. How do you expand this? 
A intersection B union A intersection B bar. These two are mutually exclusive, right? Because these two are mutually exclusive. So these two are mutually exclusive. Yes? Yes. yes. All right. So what is the probability of A? Anybody? Probability of A, B? A, B, plus A, B bar. Okay, I did something else. So, but uh, A and B are independent. So, you, we have given this expression. So, this becomes PA multiplied by PB. So, from here you have PAB bar is, look at here, PA minus PA multiplied by PB. But PA is common, so I can pull it out PA multiplied by 1 minus PB. What 1 minus PB is what? Anybody? Is PB bar. PB bar. PB bar. So look at what I have proved. I have proved that. Uh, what am I doing here? Uh, it is P A B bar equals P A times P B yeah, bar. Yeah, yeah, right. I proved this one. P A B bar is P A multiplied by P B bar. So I actually proved this relation. A and B bar are independent. Yes. So I want you to do go home and do similar things on this and this. Show yourself. Okay. So again, this is a different concept. This is not the same as mutually exclusiveness. Don't confuse these two. Independence and mutually exclusiveness are not the same. Mutually exclusive means they, they don't occur at the same time. They have no elements in common. Head and, head and tail. They are uh, mutually exclusive, right? They have nothing in common. So if you go back here, let's go back to our problem and uh, so you remember somewhere I said, uh, I hope I said that, uh, uh, I'll also put the condition here, switches operate independently. So uh, go, let's go back to our problem. <coughs> Uh, so this is a reasonable assumption. Uh, I, I haven't tied the switches together. So the switch may be closed or open independently. Now you know the concept of independence. That means all I'm trying to say is P A I A J is P A I multiplied by P A J. So this is what, uh, that's the notion of independence. All right, so someone told me that this is true, right? So the current will go through if if A1 is closed, if switch S1 is closed, or S2 is closed, or S3 is closed. So probability of S is probability of A1 union A2 union A3. How do you expand this? You know how to expand two of them. So I'm going to call this B. So this becomes PA1 union B. <coughs> so this is PA1 plus PB minus P A one B. All right, P B is what? Look at here, B is A two union A three. So this is P A one plus P A two. A two union A three is P A two plus P A three minus. What is A two union A three probability? Uh, P A two minus P A two A three. Okay, very good. Now we have to deal with this minus uh, B is what? So this is probability of A1, B is here, so that's going to be A2 union A3, so that is A1, A2 union A1, A3. A3. Right. So I'm going to write one more step here. So this is going to be PA1 plus PA2 plus PA3, that's here, minus PA2, A3. My, uh, from here, this is going to be, <coughs> call this uh, C and call this D. So that's going to be PC, which is minus PA1, A2, minus PD, call it D, that is PA1, A3, then minus minus, so that will become plus. And anybody, what is the intersection of CD? What do you get? A1, A2, intersection A1, A3. Uh, did you say? P A Y two A three. 
A1, A2, A3, right? So this is the, and now we can substitute. Look at here. PA1 is P, PA2 is P, this is P, so this is 3P. The switches are independent, so this is the product of the probability. So this is P squared, P squared, P squared. And here the switches are independent, so this is going to be a P, P, Q. P, Q. So I hope you see that. Uh, so I will I'll upload these uh, slides for you. So probability of S is 3P plus 3P squared. What is it, minus? Oh, plus PQ, right? Yes or no? Sir, please pull your paper down. What is that here? Is this right? Yeah. Professor? Yeah, you were asking me something? Uh, it's it's 412. It's almost 415. Yeah, yeah, hold on. Uh, right, let me finish this problem, though. Another way to do this is, let me show you a couple of ways to do this. Sometimes it is easier to compute S bar. Yeah. Probability of S bar is what? 1 minus? Ps. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's look at S bar. So when S bar means what? The signal at the input is not coming through at the output. When will that happen? Anybody? All of the switches are well, open. The are open. So what, how will you express it? A1 means switch A, S1 is closed. A1 is closed. S1 is closed. So you want all the switches to be open. So what will be the operation? A1 bar? A2 bar and A3 bar. Yeah. All right, so probability of S is 1 minus PS, PS bar, but S bar is 1 minus probability of A1 bar, A2 bar. Again, if you go home and see, this is going to be the product. If they are independent, that will be the product of A1, A2 bar, A3 bar. Yes. And each one is 1 minus P. So if you expand, that will be 1 minus uh, 3p plus uh, 3p squared minus p cubed. So you get the same answer, 3p minus 3p squared plus p cubed. All right, let me do the part two of this. So somebody puts in a signal here and you see the signal showing up here. So I'm writing input comes through at the output. You can see that. So this is somebody did this experiment. You see that the, so the question is, what is the status of the switch? It doesn't matter. I, I, I did the close to you do what. So what we are uh, asking is, what is the probability that switch S2 is closed given that a signal came through? So what we want is probability of uh, S2 is closed, A2 given S. So you understand part B, right? You Somebody does an experiment and you want to, knowing the result of the experiment, which is a, a signal that the input is coming through. Remember, this is a black box. You have no idea how the switches are operating. All you can see is that the current comes through. So now the question is, what is the probability that specific thing, S2 is closed? So using Bayes theorem, I'll be quick. This is this way. And we have all, most of the numbers, so I'm going to do it here. So this is going to be the denominator we just did it, 3p minus 3p squared plus p cubed. What is pa2? Anybody? 
J P. That's T. All right, yeah. so let's compute probability of S given A2. What is, so anybody think of physically, what is the probability of S given A2? Anyone? Uh, it's going to be one, I guess. Why is that? Because if one? A2 is closed, we will see. Yeah, if A2 portion. is closed, we know that the signal will go through. So this is one. So this answer is one over Three, uh, three minus whatever. So the answer is uh, one over three minus three. Minus three. Well, let's ask the other way. What is the probability that S two is open? That's more interesting. So what we are asking is, what is the probability that S two is open given S? So that is S given A two bar multiplied by P A two bar by P S. So the denominator is the same, 3p minus pq. And here, this number is what? Pa2 is? One minus Okay, let's do this. So probability of S given A2 bar. How do you compute this? That means go back to the switch. Over a. Probably S2 is going to be open. So the switch is now like this. You only have to, you have to worry about the two paths because the middle path is open. So you have a, a S1 here, S3 here, right? Yeah. So what is the probability of uh, uh, the input coming through in this condition? That's the same as what? Anyone? Uh, S1 uh, intersection S3. A1 intersection A3, right? This will be a, PA1 plus PA3 minus PA1 A3. So I hope you see that this is 2P minus P squared, right? Yeah. So you put it here, 2P minus P squared. Again, if you simplify, you will get the same answer. I hope. Let's see what is that. Did I make any mistake? So P goes away, you get uh, 2 minus P. I think you have to just do it. And I don't know, I'm sorry, you are not going to get the same answer. These are two different problems. One is probability of, uh, uh, prob this is the probability of A2 given S, switch close given S. This is switch being open given S. They are not uh, uh, one, one minus that. So anyway, you can, so here also P goes away. So this is two minus P multiplied by one minus P divided by three minus three P plus P squared. And if you expand this, what do you get? 2 minus uh, pp plus p squared uh, yeah. divided by 3 minus 3p plus p squared. Of course, if you add this plus this, you get uh, 1, as it should be. Because either this or this should be true, right? Yeah.